because guys, we need to fix that shit that we don't know we don't know. I'm gonna tell you about a woman whose heart is sunshine, whose body burn hot. I'm gonna tell you about a woman whose cold is tundra with some frozen eyes. I can tell by the way she moves. Welcome to the C-Note Show, brought to you by great men, Move Mountains. You are here because you want more love, kisses, affection, and sex in your relationship. And you found this work probably like me when you heard, I'm not in love with you, or I want a divorce, or I want space, and you're confused. And so you reached out to this tribe of men and you found this work. My name is Jeff Allen. This is Miss Cynthia Cruz. We're both professional coaches, been in private practice for years, and we specialize working with guys that, like me in the past, like I said, heard, uh, I want a divorce, or I'm not in love with you. So we help guys that are in fear of divorce or in the middle of the process now, or you're past it and you want to rebuild your life. You want to relaunch your life as a man with the knowledge of how to have phenomenal modern relationship. Because I certainly didn't learn this from my father. I didn't have a tribe of men like this to learn this until uh, basically my, my relationship, my past relationship was fucking ripped out of the book of my, my autobiography and thrown down the street, strewn down the back alley of life. And uh, that's why we launched this show going on uh, over 13 weeks ago now, 13 weeks. Yes. Yeah. It's the 62nd nice. time that we've sat down. Awesome. So, so cool. Yeah. So Cynthia is the only woman allowed in this show. She's my fiance. And like I said, she's a professional coach as well. So welcome, Cynthia. Hi. Thank you so much for being here and happy Tuesday to you. This is um, the theme this week is really exciting to me. And I really appreciate everything that you've already shared and everything that is to be put on the table in these days to come. So thank you for allowing me a seat at this table. I consider it very, very honoring and an enormous gift every day. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Yeah. Cynthia, thank you for being here. Uh, it is 11.03 here, Tuesday, like you said, Cynthia, July 14th, 2020. We've got an awesome show, like we always do, start off some, with some comedy. The comedy today is when you're too good at CPR, this is a little bit different one. I laughed my ass off last night when I found this. <laughs> and we've got an amazing spot, actually multiple spots from Esther Perel today to talk about passion, reigniting passion, because our theme of this week is just that. It's how and when to ask for more affection in your relationship. Maybe you should be asking right now. Maybe you should not. But how and when do you ask for that? We, um, I showed this, I've shown this on the uh, show many times. These are the three phases of what I call for coaching. So for one-on-one -on -one coaching, these are the three phases that I take a man through and Cynthia and I take men through, which is stop fucking up, grow yourself and your depth and your values and your boundary as a man, boundaries as a man. And then you're getting into the phase of ask, how to ask for what you want from relationship. And ask only comes when you don't have attachments to outcome, when you're not feeling jealous or angry or insecure in that moment and when you're not trying to get a particular outcome. Like me, men find this work when we were hoping to save our relationship, right? Hoping to save our marriage. And like men in the forum say, our private Facebook forum say, we come to save our marriage and we end up saving ourselves. And saving ourselves is a prerequisite for having any kind of new relationship or relaunching a relationship with your current spouse or with the next woman in your life. Because guys, we need to fix that shit that we don't know we don't know. We need, new, we need new tools. We need to have the three forms of confidence, behavioral, emotional, and spiritual like we talk about in the show. So we start with some humor, we dive into this shit like we always do, and we bounce up with a perspective and a plan about how to have an amazing life and adventure so that you can be a hero in your own life and, and you can be uh, the man of her dreams is what we say. <laughs> uh, always a little hyperbole to start us off. The man of her dreams. <laughs> So again, you are here because you want more hugs, kisses, affection, and sex, and you want to know exactly how to do that, what to say, and why you're saying those things. Here is where we do our daily work, and so let's jump into our first post from the forum. And here, the man starts off by saying, I appreciate the proactive awareness that I'm developing to understand the scared little boy inside of me. He's afraid to take a chance at doing something new, or if someone else he trusts isn't trying that endeavor first. If it's about trying an endeavor on his own, the little boy inside me is paralyzed with fear. He's afraid to fail and be a loser, and he loves the comfort of having someone else hold his hand and coddle him. 
The reality is that our failures today become our victories tomorrow via growth. So like I said, uh, he's got the scared little boy saying that he's afraid to be a loser and he loves the comfort of having someone else hold his hand and coddle him. I mean, that's all of our scared little boy guys, right? Uh, that's a piece of us that we can't just get rid of. That's in there. The reality is that our failures today become our victories tomorrow via growth. And I love this. So this man is obviously not starting his work. He wasn't born yesterday. He's been, <laughs> he's been doing this work for a while saying that he knows that our failures today become our victories tomorrow if we grow through growth. And he says, I see what has been holding me back since as long as I can look back. I need to continue to give birth to my adult version of myself and leave this inner child behind. When I feel the fear in my body, I know it's the little boy fighting growth. I will look at that as a sign to push forward. So a couple things here. I mean, he ends off by saying that fear inside of him is a sign to push forward, which I love. And that's an amazing spiritual mindset, as we would say. Uh, I, I don't agree about trying to leave our little boy behind. So quick story is in my past, uh, during the recession, so 2008, I left the banking industry and I went into a, a new field that I'm now in over a decade ago of teaching child psychology, psychology, coaching, and uh, basically mental health for over a decade ago. And between those two careers, those two lives, I went to Mexico and I put my head down on the sand and I was processing a lot of anger and a lot of grief over what was happening in my career and in my personal life at that time as well. And I tried to leave the anger behind. I tried to leave the Hulk, as you guys know that watch the show, uh, the Hulk angry part of me behind. And I tried to leave him on the sand, in the sand, his head down in Mexico, or I tried to visualize him tiny, tiny, tiny sitting in the corner. And I told him to shut up. You know, I don't want to hear from you. You're an inch high and you're in the corner. And all that does is to abdicate responsibility for that piece of me. It's shoving that piece of me down into the basement, like I say. And it's never going to go away. And what it is, is it's just isolating a part of ourself instead of integrating that part of ourself. It's shunning the shadow warrior part of myself, the the anger is a shadow piece of our warrior as, you know, a Jungian shadow or as uh, Jordan Peterson talks about or Joseph Campbell talks about in uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces, his book there, he talks about the shadow and the warrior shadow as well. And what I've really learned is it's not about leaving a piece of us behind, right? There's a, a monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, I believe is how you pronounce his name, and he's I think in his 80s now, I believe he's still alive. And he says, uh, of our anger or of our little boy is that we want to hold him like a baby mm. and we want to cradle our anger or cradle that fear like it's a baby of ours, not to try to leave it behind, not, not to be angry or to shame the baby, but just to be there for him and to not try to fix it, but to be there for our little boy, right? So the understanding, and I want to ask you, Cynthia, if this is similar for a woman, is that for a man, anger feels really powerful, and yet it's obviously perceived as dangerous. Uh, we don't want to be seen as a bad guy, an asshole. So a lot of times, instead of integrating that and understanding that, we try to leave it behind, or we're afraid of what might happen. Um, and I love what this man says about it's a sign to push forward, but for you personally, or for you know, the women in our lives, right? Help us with some perspective. What does that look like when a woman has anger or fear and maybe when she is shutting it away so that we can start to understand and how to dance with these emotions instead of just being afraid of them? Uh, um, well, I, it was interesting listening to you talk because I was remembering so many times in my life where I tried to bury my wasn't anger it was like yearning desire um craving for connection and um like a hunger for that and i there were many times that i literally tried to bury that in sand or on rocks that were thrown into water and it was the same kind of thing that it never it never just dissipated. I was never 
hungry less. I was never just this perfect, like empty vase of needing nothing. <laughs> um, so that that's to me kind of the feminine part of that. Um, when a woman is like stuffing the anger and other emotions in her, um, trying to bury them, um, that's when the light goes out in her. That's when, I mean, I mean, we all know that, and men have this kind of, they have their own radiance too, and a woman who's sourcing and has emotion, like, and the radiance, the light that shines off of her is compelling and lights us up, lights me up, um, whether she's my, like, eight-year-old niece or an 80-year-old grandmother. Um, and then we also know what that looks like when it's kind of become stone and you don't feel a source of like energetic uplift being around her and, and maybe it feels a little dull or boring or grayed out. And that's, that's what happens when things get really stuffed and whether she stays really quiet in that mode or she you know, reaches out and snaps back those are two ways that that can come out. So. Yeah, so shuts down or snaps back could be not great ways that she responds. Um, we're going to get into, and this is a theme of a lot of guys, which is she's decided, whatever that means in her life, that she's no longer interested in sex, whether it's with you or just forever again or in this relationship or until you prove yourself to do one, two, three, She's decided to, to shut that down within herself or, or just arbitrarily, not even arbitrarily, I should say, but with great reason in her mind. But to us, we are confused by that. So sometimes it seems arbitrary to a man because he doesn't understand yeah. when and why she's shutting that down. So that, that's something that we'll definitely get into on the show today. I want to ask you about later as we go forward, right? And guys, that's a good segue for me to say, I, again, I'd love for you to raise your hand and bring in a question or post in the chat like you always do. I already see that Andy's posted in the chat, which is awesome. Uh, there's been a, f a phenomenal amount of activity on the forum, which you guys are phenomenal, supporting each other, asking great questions. I think there was three, in the last 12 hours or so, maybe the last 16 hours, three gigantic threads and three amazing big questions. Uh, so I would love for you to come on the show, for those of you that are involved in those threads, and ask about them if you like. And so think about that while I'm sharing this comedy for today. <laughs> oh my God, it's a little bit different. I'm going to share it right now. It's when you're good at CPR. Here we go right now. Very good. Two rescue breaths and 30 chest compressions. Okay. Um, uh, we want nice, steady compressions. What? Look at trap. That's CPR that'll save a life. Oh, thanks. I used to be a lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? I don't know. Where am I? You were too good at CPR. The shore. That's the last thing I remember. I was straining towards the shore, but every stroke just carried me further and further away. You. He saved my life. How could I ever repay you? You saved me. You saved me. Don't you fucking touch me! No, Maria. Maria! I remember now. We were both out in the surf. She was calling out to me. Why didn't you save her? I tried! You have to have steady compression Stop Somebody it. help me! Please, why are you all just standing there? Please help me! I don't have any arms! Oh. 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 Somebody fucking do something! Oh. 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 What's happening? Jeez. Oh, oh. oh, God. Whoa! Can you run? Oh, oh, my God. Katie. What did you do? Trap, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh my god. I was screaming and laughing and crying at the same time when I saw that. Oh. Oh. What did you do? Ah! I like how she goes and just smashes the head of the other one. That chick is she she wants to be in a zombie movie, I think. Some of what's going on. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Well, I could just segue hard for a metaphor of <laughs> like, is that you trying to resuscitate your dead relationship? Oh, oh my God. So, I mean, that actually, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great way to say the way this is. Uh, <laughs> oh, that dude in the background just like, ah, it's yelling. I can't get over it. Ah. Uh, so the metaphor of, you know, we don't want version one of our relationship any longer. So maybe the CPR dummy is version one of our relationship. <laughs> Ian's still laughing. <laughs> oh. And if you're, trying, if you're trying to give CPR to the, de the dead zombie of your old relationship, probably not a good idea. You know, it's got no arms and legs anymore. Maybe we should, maybe we should move forward. Oh, my goodness. So in all seriousness, in all seriousness, there needs to be... <laughs> Maybe in seriousness, there, there needs to be a delineation between the old relationship and, and version 2.0. Okay. And that doesn't mean that, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be happy to restart something new with your spouse. Of course you would be. And that's what our dream is, right? The dream, the ideal is that, is that you bring it back to life. But the night, the nightmare is right guys, that if you do that without doing your own work, if we don't go through if we don't go through the growth phase here for your own self, if you don't stop fucking up and you don't go through the growth phase for yourself, the new, the relationship isn't going to be what you want. I mean, we've all seen pet cemetery <laughs> like, <Stop. you> know, <laughs> and you don't want, you don't want the same thing happening again. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> how about Cynthia? You on, let's honor our chat, Cynthia. Here, no. here, <laughs> Oh my God. Talk about the mirror neurons, uh, right? Yeah, exactly. But Stop laughing, Ian. <laughs> it's not funny. It's really funny, actually. Yeah, some things are worse than death, Tim says. Yeah, I agree. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I, so see, I want to say again that there are many guys, including myself, right? And so I'm going to get, I'll get super vulnerable here. I've said this one other time on the show, which is, I did the begging and the crying and the wishing that she would stay, even though she slept with another man earlier that year, even though we went through therapy for six months and she basically blamed me and didn't talk about the relationship at all. She'd never once brought up the relationship the final year at, you know, year plus of our relationship, never wanted to talk about things. I was the bad guy. Um, you know, this, 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 and then I would get frustrated and angry. And then she'd point at me, look, see, you're the bad guy. You're angry. Look at you. And so that was me. And I, I would not have wanted that same relationship again. I have said on this show that I did reattract her about six months after separation and we had filed divorce papers and divorce took a while. Right. But so about six months later, I did reattract her. We started to date again while I was dating other women. And at that time, I decided I didn't want to be with her. She had not grown. Cynthia and I have talked about this. She had not grown. My ex had not grown. She was still calling me based literally the villain. She was still saying it was all my fault. She was still bringing up stuff from eight, nine, ten years prior that I had moved on from, and I wasn't willing to uh, – drink the swamp water of that old story. I wasn't willing to be in that old Shakespearean tragedy of the relationship that she wanted to, uh, you know, put upon us in that third entity. I wasn't willing to wear the bad guy pirate costume in the relationship, especially hell no, hell no in version 2.0. And so that's when I said I didn't want to date her I didn't want to be physical anymore. And she was actually angry at me at that point, blaming me for, she said that um, I was punishing her for her telling me her truth. That's what she said. And her truth was I was the bad guy and I wasn't willing to be in that Shakespearean tragedy any longer. And so, <laughs> so we don't want the old relationship. We must have a delineation between the version one and two, whatever that looks like. It doesn't have to be divorce. It could be space. It could be a month of, you know, 
she takes her space. It depends on how you guys can actually do this. If you have professional help, that can be a delineation. If you're separated, that's a delineation. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And even if you get divorced, you could still get back together. You could still date each other again after divorce, start something new after divorce. So I want everyone to open their minds to the possibility here and also open your mind to you do not want to cage yourself in and say, uh, well, I would never separate. I would never take space. Or you also don't want to say, well, if she says she wants space, then just fuck her and divorce automatically. And I'm never going to talk with her again. You know, we don't need to do those two ends of the spectrum. There's a lot of different opportunities in the middle. And that's what, <laughs> that's the conversation I'm, I'd love for us to have ongoing for the rest of this week, gentlemen. So, so yeah, if you'd honor our chat and guys raise your hand, if you want to come in with a situation where you're wanting more physicality in the relationship, You've maybe been doing this work here, guys, for three months or six months, or you've, you know, you're two books in, you're five books into the reading, and you have a question about this theme of our week, right? How and when to ask for more physical affection in your relationship. So, yeah, please, Cynthia, that's, that's enough for me. Go for <laughs> well, it. Well, thank you, um, Dan. I really appreciate your comment. Um, you said, I found, I built up anger and resentment when my wife got to that point. And I, I think that's about when she shut down and was about not having sex and um, totally kind of put that block up. And then um, when, she could, when she did get angry and lash out, it was really hard to stay calm and neutral in our, in our relationship. Um, and I, that seems like an incredible skill if, I mean, all of us, if we're faced with someone um, who's like cut off from us, it's like they don't want to share affection with us. There's this constant mirror, this constant thought that, you know, you don't deserve this. You don't get to have this as a human being in someone else's face. And then they have anger toward us. That takes a lot of presence and centeredness to, to, you know, it's kind of like holding two energies at once, the hurt of it. And am I believing that this is true? And then, you know, how could this person who's hurting me in that anyways, be lashing out, making me the bad guy? Um, I really like how you use the metaphor of like, you're, you're going to wear the pirate costume um, because that's what... I'm seeing in you. Yeah. So let me ask. I, I see a mistake that I made a lot in the past and that men are asking about on the forum and that I saw in a video, an Esther Perel video. We're going to get into an Esther Perel video here shortly. Uh, one of her interviews, she has a podcast. Uh, it's called Where Shall We Begin? Where she published 10 different sessions with her clients. And one of them as I alluded to before the show. So she's feeling hurt and closed down and blaming, mm -hmm. and he's trying to logically explain what he's saying, mm -hmm. and it's going nowhere fast. Mm -hmm. right? So what happens for a woman when she's sort of decided, because it's the truth of her emotions, that you're the, you have the pirate costume on, and I'm shutting, I'm shutting emotionally, I'm shutting down emotionally, and this is how it needs to be because I need to protect myself. And the man says, well, I'm just trying to explain my point of view. I may not be right, and it's, but I'm trying to explain my, it's kind of like usually kind of like, <laughs> I just, <laughs> so what, what happens for a woman when the man tries to logically explain his way into or through that emotional situation? Well, in that moment, it almost felt like um, he, you were saying, well, what you're feeling and experiencing is wrong, um, too much, maybe too emotional, um, but, but mostly like wrong. Like, um, and it felt like a kind of a stabbing into my heart a little bit. Wow, it was only like two sentences in and it felt like stabbing into your heart, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so again, I want to bounce to you guys. I know... 
I, I was trying not to laugh reading the chat again about the, the video earlier, so I won't look at the chat. <laughs> I'll let Cynthia look at the chat. Um, but I know that there are some men in this situation right now, and you may not want to ask a question, that's fine, but I want you to feel free to post a question in the chat if you don't want to speak up, that's totally cool. Okay, guys? So let me move on to uh, this Esther Perel video, and I will put the link in the chat. That's one of the benefits of being here live on the show, guys, is we put links in the chat live. You can chat with each other privately over the Zoom chat, of course. So you get all the cutting edge stuff live. That's why you're here, guys. So to honor this clip here, here's the title screen, In Search of Erotic Intelligence with Esther Perel. And I'm going to share just a two-minute clip to open us up where she talks a little bit about her background and then talks about connecting with your own aliveness. So the prerequisite for this work, like I said, guys, is to find yourself, to save yourself, to reconnect with your own aliveness. And that's part of our adventure in life. And that's what a woman is attracted to. That's what draws a woman in. If you don't have your own aliveness, there's nothing for her to love or be attracted to. So let's share this with Esther Perel right now. I come from a family of two parents who were concentration camp survivors. My two parents are the sole survivors of their entire family. And I grew up in a community in Antwerp, Belgium, that was exclusively Holocaust survivors. And in this community, I always saw two groups of people, those who did not die and those who came back to life. And those who did not die lived rather tethered to the ground. The world was a dangerous place you could not trust, and certainly you could not enjoy or experience pleasure, because if you did, it meant you went not on guard, and if you were not on guard, shit could happen. And those who came back to life are those who understood the erotic. Eroticism as a life force, not just in its modern, narrow definition of sex, but basically, how do you reimagine yourself? How do you reinvent yourself? How do you bring back an energy, a vitality, an aliveness? And it was my parents who inspired me to look at it like that. So much of what I try to do is actually help people connect with their aliveness. And aliveness goes with meaning, goes with purpose, goes with creativity, goes with playfulness, and goes with connection to oneself, to, the, to one's partners, families, and to the world, to the politics of the world. And I think much of what you will hear from me comes from this source. This is probably what has influenced the most. How I think, how I look at the world, what I do, and so forth. So let's, let's talk about that for a moment. I, I was not in a place in 2015 to think about, well, where is my aliveness? And I, hadn't, I did not have a group like this. I had a men's group with Steve Horseman every two weeks that I found after the fact, after therapy and after the divorce, you know, she said divorce and after she was moving out, that's when I found a every two week meds group. Definitely didn't have something like this. And I, meaning I didn't have a model of what to do on a daily basis. I didn't know there was, Esther Perel was doing this work. I had no idea. So I didn't even occur to me to think, well, where is my aliveness? I was just in the fucking pit in the abyss in free fall off the cliff. Yeah. Right? So when a man comes to you, what do you, how, how can you as a woman help him to start to realize that any woman in his life, right, including the spouse that right now is saying these nasty things because that's truly what she believes and feels in this moment, how can you even open the door for him to start to realize that the aliveness that he maybe lost a decade ago or 15 years ago or 25 years ago is what drew her in the first place? So at the very least, he needs to find that own spark within himself. Yeah, well, it's important for you, us, me, to be in our aliveness in general. I mean, women in the same way, if she is not in her aliveness, it's going to be less attractive and um, not compelling and not inspiring. Um, I think aliveness comes when we recognize the things that we've been believing 
or making true about what we've experienced for those like 10 years or whatever has, you know, literally poured the water on the flame. Um, what are we believing about ourselves? What we're worth, um, our trajectory in life and finding what's really true there. And then it, it's almost like aliveness becomes a momentum uh, all of its own because it's, it feels a lot better to breathe than to feel like you're suffocating. Um, and so I think being able to attract someone is, is secondary to being able to breathe and to have there be color in your life. And that's, I do know in those places where it, it, you feel like the flame has gone, the fire is gone from you, you've lost everything. Um, it, it is, it takes a lot of gumption. It takes a lot to breathe again. It takes a lot to look at what am, what am I truly believing? Um, and it, it does feel like you're moving through mud for a while. And eventually you get to pull your feet out of the mud and the climb feels, it feels easier. Um, but I, I don't want to negate how tough the mud is at times. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'd love for you to honor our chat here in a moment, Cynthia. Um, gentlemen, maybe this is a rhetorical question, but for me, so I asked myself, how could I feel more alive every day, even though I'm going through the shit? And for me, it was the men's group that I was in. For me, it was the coach that I hired. For me, it was the book, the books that I was reading and then I could talk with other men about. And that's what I'm hoping to bring you here. And I, and I'm, you know, I'd love for you to chime in if that's the case or post in chat. And I know, you know, I, I, maybe this is a leading question because so many of you guys, I honor you so much for being here every single day. You know, I love you guys, Tim and Rob and Ruben, Randy, Patrick, Kent, and Jason and Jason, Jack, Ian, Harry, Dave, Dan, Brett, and Andy. You guys are phenomenal. This is where we do our daily work. And a part of this is to do this together as, like I say, the Spartan that's next to you. It's it's infinitely more powerful than me trying to do it alone when I was going through this. And so I'm happy that we can have that modeling for each other and to lift each other up. And that's what we do on the forum too. So yeah, if you'd honor our chat, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that. well, Tim, I, I very much appreciate what you shared. Um, and that's what I was thinking of when I said, God, you're, you know, when it feels like feet are in the mud, you said, this is a really hard thing because in my case, when she, my wife, shut down, her truth felt like serious betrayal to me. She asked to open our marriage and told me that I'd never cared about her sexual needs and that I was just not capable of meeting them. It is so hard for me not to say, well, I think you're being a, how do you say it? Duplic Duplicitous, du yeah. Thank you. I have a new term du now. Du Duplic, <laughs> yes, that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think you're being an asshole right now in this moment. It's, and I can, that makes sense. That would be hard to not. Yeah. So, so Tim, I want to say, however we feel is okay. There's not necessarily good or bad in what we feel. It's, it's the behavior that we have. And I think you'd agree with that certainly. And God, how fucking painful when she comes and says, you've never cared about her sexual needs and you're not capable of meeting them. I mean, just a broad, sweeping, disastrous, uh, crumbling accusation of who you are as a man sexually and your intentions and your integrity of caring for her or not. I mean, just an absolute personal character assassination um, and personal attack is what that feels like, right? So that's, that's fucking disastrous, and I'm so sorry that you've had to go through that, right? There's, I have a lot of questions about that, um, but... You know, I'll, I'll, you didn't ask a question there, so I won't, <laughs> I won't assume anything, Tim, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's so let, yeah, I mean, one of my, one of my experience experiences was seeing a text on her phone from another man and, you know, in the middle of the night at 3 AM when I thought it was my phone and it's actually her phone and it's a text from another man saying, I can't wait to touch your body, love from another man and me just basically like losing my shit. Like what the fuck, you know? I, I didn't handle that very well, Tim, but I don't know if there's like a very well way to handle that. I mean, I didn't put hands on her or anything like that. I was yelling and like 
livid angry and like what the fuck um yeah so so like i just want to say you know emotions are uh, we're all human we all have the same set of emotions and being destroyed by something like that i would say that's a normal thing man and i'm glad that you're here i'm glad that you're here so i saw ruben raised to sandy yeah, ruben do you want to come on in and share with us please yeah um i just wanted to say that you know I shared a bunch of things or nasty things that my wife shared with me and it actually helped me grow more into myself. Yes. Part of it was, you know, I'm not going to let you speak to me that way anymore. And I'm going to focus on growing myself and make myself better. Um, but what I, what I want, what I want to get across is that, you know, when you're sometimes that's a gift that your wife can provide to you to push you off and to grow in yourself. But at the same time, what I've learned over the past week through the through meditation and everything is um, that I don't have to continue to rush and push away from her. I've actually seen her want to stay in the same room with me more now. And it's a little confusing to me. And I was in that mind train of like, no, no, I'm going to keep on pushing and growing and you know, get away from me. And I have talked to me that way. But through the meditation and calming myself down, I realized that, you know, she is just expressing what she's doing. It actually helped me to push and start growing. She sees the growth and she's more gravitated towards it. So what I can do now is, you know, be more empathetic and just try to understand that where she is, it's kind of where I was a couple of years ago where I was really angry and I was just being mad at her for no reason. And it was, it's kind of the same thing. So I don't know if this is the right thing that I'm doing, but it just, to me, it, intuitively it feels right. Yeah. So I was going to ask you a question and you kind of answered it at the end there, which is there's not necessarily a right or wrong. It's, how are you driving your own life based off of your values and what you want in this chapter of your life? Right. So, I mean, if, if we're looking at outcome uh, at outcomes and she's wanting to spend more time with you, well then it sounds like it's, it's working quote unquote to draw her in towards you. But I think really what you're looking for. So Ruben, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the very least you're looking for her to respect you as a person. That's the number one thing that I'm hearing from you. And the way you are doing that is to take a step back and to have higher regard for yourself and yes, set boundaries. You know, you've said, Hey, it's not okay to talk with me like that, but you're not looking for anything from her. When you say that you're not trying to coerce her, you're not trying to manipulate her into doing something for you. You're in the space where, Hey, regardless, I'm not allowing that to happen any longer one way or the other. Is that, is that fair to say? Ruben? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not doing this to get her close to me. The whole point of doing that was I see an opportunity to grow myself. I'm just seeing that growth from myself. I can see her wanting to be in the same room with me more. Um, I don't apologize for telling her what I want for dinner, and she you know, does that um, and things that she wasn't doing before. But no, not at any point was I doing this to trick her into into coming back to me. And um, on a on a side note, um, I just got my mug, so thank you guys. No! I just walked up to my house and I see a, <laughs> I see the package, so thank you. Oh, that's awesome. nice. You're welcome, dude. Yeah, so phenomenal. Well, I'm gonna press pause on you, Ruben, and I'll jump I'll jump back to what you said here. Um, so I, dude, I love that that you're doing this for yourself. The mindset that you're having. I'm going to share the screen and go over to our three forms of confidence here. The three forms of confidence are emotional, behavioral, and spiritual. And the spiritual why, the mindset, is that I'm doing this for me, and I'm doing this because I'm finding my spark as a man again. I lost my spark. I abdicated that to someone else by accidentally or inadvertently, uh, incorrectly, whatever word you want to pick there put it on her or put it on things outside of myself instead of relying on my own self, right? The emotional confidence, the how to have emotional control, that was a big difficult, that was tough for me 
when the rush of anger and energy comes up and hits the back of my head and you know the Hulk wants to come out, I had to practice a lot of those body exercises, breathing, being aware, being tethered to presence as we talk about here too as well. So, so much good stuff in what Ruben was saying there. So phenomenal. But so the, yeah, if you don't honor our chat again, you guys are awesome. I want to make sure we don't miss any questions in chat. Can you please? Well, yeah, I was, I wanted to touch back in on, on Tim's story, but um, Brett, you said an amazing thing. You were, even in the roughest of situations, you were kind of seeing that there's a gift when she or someone in our life, like, triggers a big response from us um and you said she stated before that i was all talk when she left months later i looked back and i can see that in certain situations that was definitely true i could have taken a more active role in certain things um so i appreciate that you shared that and that's it's incredibly honoring brett to that that space between you and your wife, like even in a separated, no longer with each other place to honor that everything that came up as a rough and ragged as it was at times serves a purpose, carries a why, can breathe life back into what you are truly wanting, what she's truly wanting. So I appreciated that. And Tim, I, I appreciate what you said. You know, you said the revelation happened at the end of last year. I spent several months considering it. We ended up spending several months apart from March to last week. In April, I finally accepted that I don't have to be okay with being in an open marriage and told her that I'd rather be divorced. We talked about divorce for a few days and she asked to postpone serious movement toward dissolution until we were back in person. Um, and, and that to me, that's so incredible, strong, powerful. And it kind of talks about what we're saying this week of knowing when to ask. And a lot that's been so far is like, oh, but the anger comes up and it feels impossible. Knowing when to ask is when you've come to a place where you're like, no, there's, there's something here that I'm not willing to, I'm not okay with. I'm not willing to accept the, the, like, the swamp water you're pouring into this bowl between us. And that kind of um, solidity is when you know that the ask is the right time. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that, Tim. Yeah, I, I love that. And it reminds me of something you've said many times, which is she has to have something to push against with you. If there's nothing to push against, then she, let's say, won't respect what you're saying. She won't respect you as a man within the relationship. She won't think that anything's going to be different if she doesn't feel any kind of boundary of, no, I'm not going to move past this. I'm not going to open the marriage up. I'm not going to value, uh, devalue my own self. I'm not going to violate my integrity or my values in that way. No, I'd rather go this other direction if I need to, right? So it's, I'm going this way, and would you like to be aboard on my journey? I'm, my ship is sailing. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be aboard? I'd rather be divorced than that other option. So that's the direction I'm going. And she said, wait, 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 I'd like to talk about it. Um, obviously, we don't want to assume anything what's going to happen from here. I mean, every person's exact situation is different. But I find it interesting that she wanted to press pause before any kind of, you know, disillusion. I think that's really interesting. Uh, so if I'm you, I definitely want to be checking in with my emotions throughout that I'm not expecting one thing or the other. And I'm also not naive to one thing or the other, either you know, good or bad, right? It's, it's not about shoving our head in the sand. It's about being curious and aware of the emotions that are coming up and curious of what's going to happen, even moment to moment when you're talking with her. So that's, you know, if, if we were doing a coaching conversation, I'd dive into that a little bit more. Um, but I think that's the next, the next step. I'm, I'm sure we're all really curious to see what's going to happen. Yeah, what else is in the chat, please? Well, I think Dan uh, had to jump off, but he was saying... Um, I have found having my kingly plan 
and other men like this group, spending time with my kids, creating new men or memories and adventures make me feel alive. And um, Dave also shared, I've been experiencing alive days more frequently through the work that I've been doing. It's still hard to maintain that alive feeling every day. Sometimes the down feelings can last a couple days and then, and then I bounce back. It's all in my mind um, that brings me down those days. Uh, I, can, I can certainly <laughs> resonate with how the mind loves to do that at times. Um, and then Jason said the daily work providing this regularly helps us create new habits of, of self-improvement. The regular focus on improvement creates momentum, and the momentum is what truly creates major change. Oh my gosh, that's something that I underestimated in the past was the, the small momentum, the small daily changes, or, uh, you know, we think we have to have this, what's the giant, giant purpose of my life? You know, what's the pedestal that I can stand on or the flashing sign that I can illuminate of the purpose of my life? And that's not how this works. Like the, pur the purpose starts with, okay, I'm going to get up in the morning and actually care about my body. I'm going to care about my mind. I'm going to care about my spiritual mindsets. Okay. I'm going to journal. I'm going to write for myself for two minutes. I'm going to write one appreciation. It starts with things that are deceptively small that begin to snowball into something larger and larger and larger over time. I mean, we're, we underestimate what we can do in a year's time and we overestimate what we should be able to do in one day or one week. And I think that's just how, <laughs> that's our part of our human experience is we're always striving, but we underestimate what we can do in three months or six months or 12 months. And that's how I relate to that. When, when we fall into despair and stop the daily little small increments, that's when it becomes dangerous. And mm -hmm. right? that's when we fall into addictions much more easily. We isolate ourselves right? And that's why you're here for each other. We're here for each other is even one sentence in the forum or one sentence to a private chat to a man here or an email to us or a request for us. You know, we do free initial consultations, guys. So if you're wanting to talk about one-on-one, -on -one, if you're wanting to ask a really private question that you want to bring to us, you know, contact us directly and I'll give the, the forum link at the end of the show today. Love you guys. So I want to jump over to Esther Perel. Again, there's another particular spot where she talks about modern relationship and how to look at sex and marriage through a new lens, the new lens of you know, what are we facing in today's world? I'm going to share this right now. Here we go, more Esther Burrell. Actually, and I know a lot about who you are as a person. Tell me about this relationship and we know a lot, and so forth, from the micro to the macro. This thing called sexuality, it's a lens. It's not an act. And the notion that say, relationships start passionate and they just have one way to go and that's down, is also a fallacy. We should have a day just to debunk all the myths and all the misconceptions by which we often think about these things. A lot of people, Sexuality and the connection and the intimacy improves when their sense of self-worth improves, when they feel better about themselves, when they accept themselves more, then they, when they are less riddled with shame. It's all of that that goes into the experience. And because we live in a performance-driven, industrialized place, we really would like to be able to quantify sex. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause right there because something she just said in the past 30 seconds was so powerful is that sex and relationships improve when we can flush out shame from our own selves. So without even having to do anything else, I'd love for you to talk about, well, what's the intention like if I'm flushing shame out of my own self? And if I have a hope and a wish and a vision for there be, to be less shame in her life or in my family's life or in other people's lives without me having to do it all myself. If I do that for myself and hope and vision for them to have that happen in their life without me doing or saying or trying to talk my way through it, how does that come across to you and a woman in relationship? Even if I don't say that I'm doing anything, I'm just working on flushing shame out of my own self. 
my gosh. It is all that I felt was just, you know, honored, excited for, you know, men and women to be in relationships where, you know, there's someone who's actively taking that role of like, there's energy here in my own being that I've carried with me that comes probably from generations before me. And, you know, I, I understand that there's energy, shames, guilt, um, things in, in my partner that have come from before, have come maybe from generations before. And to have someone be in that kind of leadership of vision and intention that um, we don't, we don't have to, and we can intend and wish for others that they don't have to carry those really heavy loads with them. Um, because we all feel it, right? Whether it's a, a very absolute conscious thing, we, we feel we feel other people and things that we know in our own emotional resonance, we can sense when they have similar experiences as well. And I think that can really nag on us if we're wanting to be provider, protector, just a good person in this person's life. Cause we, we, can, we know and we wanna do everything possible to give them freedom. Yeah, absolutely. Give them freedom. And it's, it's also the other side of the coin is that it's condescending if we don't give them a level of agency and freedom and uh, power over their own lives. Right. It's I, <laughs> like, uh, if the other person feels we're looking down on them, there's not a lot of chance of vulnerable connection. Mm -hmm. And every man that's here, we're in this work, guys. You believe what we believe. This our tribe is here because we love relationship. We love women. We want connection. We want passion. And so if we don't understand that accidentally or trying to logic our way through something makes her feel dismissed, like, like she's wrong, if it makes her feel like we don't, believe she knows what she can do in her own life, or if we don't believe that she has agency over her own life, there's no chance for vulnerable, close connection in that situation. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. It, that ends up going into the basket she's created of, he doesn't, if he doesn't care, he doesn't really care about me. He's not in interested in my needs. It's all about it's all about him and it's it, controlling me. Yeah. Is yeah. that, that going to the controlling as well? If I'm. Or the judging, like, the judging. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let me finish. Thank you guys. Uh, let's finish the last couple of minutes of this particular clip from Esther Perel. We're moving toward the end of our show here. Any orgasm, how hard, how long, how many pills and all of that, rather than understand that the erotic is a beautiful radiant interlude that is massively unproductive. It has no numbers. You can't measure it. It's a state of being. <clears throat> and that in order to be able to have that experience around the erotic, what we need today is a level of relational intelligence. And why is this so important? You know, 10, 15 years ago, if I went to a company to work on relationships in the company, it usually was because there was a crisis. And it was called the soft skills. Nobody cared a great deal about this, as long as it could help with the bottom line. But everything has shifted to an economy of service. So is marriage, by the way, an economy of service. We want an experience in marriage. We want to feel connected, we want to feel known, we want to feel seen, we want to feel a sense of purpose, we want to feel special. If that ain't service, what is? So we are completely in an economy of service and experience. And for that, we need relational intelligence. We need to understand the basics of how we connect to others, how we respect others, how we share our values, how we trust them, how we let them trust us, how we can dream with them, all of those major pieces that have come to be known as relational intelligence. It's not the tasks that you accomplish. It's how you attend to the many other things around you while you are attending to the task. Very different. 
And the good thing about intelligence is that you can cultivate it. Some of us have a better sensibility about it, but we can really all cultivate it. So, I mean, I found that this, the first time I listened to it about, wow, marriage has become this place of service where we both are now expecting so much more from the relationship. At first, that seemed really heavy to me. And then I realized that I, as a man, feel fulfilled by accepting responsibility, by taking responsibility for things in my life and then moving bit by bit into them. And I've noticed that well, you, you, women, and every woman, woman that I, through the men that I coach, respond to that mm. viscerally, uh, evolutionarily, biology, bio, biologically, respond when I, as a man, take responsibility for things in my life and within the relationship. Mm. So say a few words about that, please. And also, if you'd honor our chat in the last couple of minutes of the show, please. Well, thank you. I, I just, there was some wonderful feedback about, you know, any man is capable of, of anything. And whether that's sexuality, sex, like connecting with his partner, sexuality as a man, in his purpose, in his mission, that, and I think that's what you were just sharing is that energy of an experience of capability, um, yeah. that for that momentum that was brought up a little while ago. And um, that calms, I feel like a, a calming being in that presence. Um, I feel the solidity of that presence, but it, it's a moving forward. And I think uh, one of, you know, a woman's fears is that, you know, kind of what Esther Perel was saying that, you know, we'll get into a relationship and it will just stay stuck and there's no like movement forward. And at that point, she might try to create that movement herself by doing different things or leaving. But when she feels like there's this continual movement, solid presence forward, uh, it is, I think it's the new level of emotional intelligence yeah. and relationship intelligence. Yeah, that's a new level, certainly. And, and it, we start by understanding that. We start by understanding that it, it's not supposed to stay stagnant. You know, that we can't just put out things on autopilot, that the mode is stepping forward, right? And that becomes normal. It becomes a routine. Our skills become automatic as we practice them through this work, this daily work, reading the books that we talk about, you know, coaching that you can get, whether it's with us or with another amazing coach within the tribe. You know, we support you guys in that endeavor. Absolutely. So, Cindy, let's honor our men and we'll close our show. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for today and for standing in your own presence and the mountains that I know you move, you know, one step at a time every day. And thank you, Tim, for being here and Rob and Ruben and Randy. Thank you. And Patrick, Kent and Jason and Jason, Jack and Ian, Harry, thank you for being here. Dave, thank you for what you shared in the chat. Brett, thank you for what you shared in the chat as well. And Andy is here. It was, um, a deep pleasure and a deep honor to sit here with you today. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Cynthia. Appreciate it. This has been the C-Note Show brought to you by Great Men Move Mountains and greatmenmovemountains.com. If you want to talk with us one-on-one, -on -one, greatmenmovemountains.com slash contact or our relaunch small coaching group has, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, two out of six guys have paid and four other men are interested. I'm not sure if the other four are going to come through. If they do, that will fill the group. But what I want you to do is if you're interested in the small group, it's powerful, it's economical, go to greatmenmovemountains.com slash relaunch. Read the information, put in your stuff. It's likely that one or two out of the four that are interested right now may not come through, right? So if you want to either be in this group or be on the wait list or ask more about it, do that now. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. And look out for those CPR dummies. You never know. Yeah, man. Those dummies are, <laughs> they'll, they'll hop up and get you. You got to watch it. <laughs> you got to watch out. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Ciao. It's sunshine. Whose body burn hot. I'm a thinky about a woman who's cold. It's tundra with some frozen eyes. I can tell by the way she moves that she cares and it's lovely.